Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to another episode of Student Success Beyond Expectations. Today, we bring you a very well-versed, knowledgeable, and motivated Dr. Narissa Bauer. She is a behavioral pediatrician and she is the CEO of Let's Talk Kids Health. And she's all about how to help children and families to manage their symptoms of ADHD. So welcome, Dr. Bauer. Thank you so much, Lisa, for having me on. I'm so excited to chat with you today. I'm excited to have you. You know, as a behavioral pediatrician, there's so many different dynamics that you've seen. And you've really taken such time in understanding the implications of what ADHD has on not just children's self-esteem, but their dynamics socially in the classroom, in schools, outside of schools, and with their families. So would you please just share with the listeners What brought you to really extend your practice and your knowledge base to be able to help these children? Oh, I love this question. So um, as you mentioned, I'm a behavioral pediatrician, and I often get asked the question, like, what is that? And so I'll start there. It's basically I'm a pediatrician by training. However, I... I focus and work with families of kids who think and learn differently. Of that, a large subset are kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, but it can also mean I'm working with families who have kids with anxiety, depression, uh, learning disabilities, any other um, condition that can influence how they're thriving at home and school. Um, And I love what I do. And as part of that, you know, I can make the diagnosis and then together with families, I craft a treatment plan. And oftentimes parents come to me with that worry that once their child is diagnosed with ADHD, that automatically means medication. Uh, And I'm here to tell everybody that medicine can work, but there is, that is one part of the treatment plan. And it may or may not be the first line, depending on a couple different factors, but together we talk through the different elements of treatment. And that's really what led me to understanding that there are gaps in what we can do and provide for families in a general pediatrics um, office, because my colleagues who are general pediatricians doing the hard work of, you know, providing vaccines, doing um, well child visits, I mean, they are very busy. And as you know, mental health and behavioral health conditions really take time to unpack and really understand. Um, And it's just really hard to do that in a very fast paced, high output office. And it's not to say that they don't care about these things, they absolutely do. But when when a diagnosis is made in a general pediatrics office, typically the pediatrician can only prescribe medications. They then talk briefly to families about the importance of um, connecting to the school and working with the school, getting some behavioral therapy going and parenting support, but, but it's not necessarily them. They usually have to make referrals out. And so the reason I do the work that I do is because I saw families falling through the gaps because they know that they need to do this, but it can be really challenging logistically to just get connected. Sometimes there's a wait list. Sometimes there's just nobody in the community offering parenting support. And so really my, what I do in my business is really to provide that safety net and the onboarding for both kids and parents to learn together So that way they become a team, they strengthen their bond, and they really learn how to communicate, collaborate, and connect with each other. Right, because what you're saying really is it's a specialty. There's a lot that goes, right? I mean, it's so much that goes on. uh, And that blanket of here's a list of referrals and or places that you could go. And here's a little bit about information. It's almost does it injustice. Yeah, and it's overwhelming. I mean, it's so hard for families to like look at a list of people and without knowing anything about them. Like, who do I call? How do I know that they're going to be a good fit? Right. Um, So yes, all of that. Right. So now that we know of how it's so important to really address these um, ADHD in a way that is comprehensive, 
Uh, tell us about your views on how schools, families, and someone such as yourself being a behavioral pediatrician can work with one another. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, there is a reason why that that saying it takes a village exists because it really does. So um, I often try to help our families understand they are at the center of this team that they're going to begin like assembling. Right. So um, the medical piece, uh, then the school piece, because we need to think about how ADHD affects kids in their different spheres. And kids spend a lot of their time at home or school. So it naturally lends itself to then thinking about, well, who in the education sphere do we need to involve on our team? Whether that child is a preschooler and you need to involve the daycare provider or the preschool teacher versus the elementary education teacher or the tutor or therapist, right? So we need to think about who are the relevant people at the table, but helping families understand that they drive the agenda. We are all there to help them, but it also can feel a little daunting for them because they're like, okay, but I'm the person who knows all these people. So how do I get all these people talking? Right. Right. And so, but, but it's so important to do that because um, we are all individually seeing these are the child in different settings Mm -hmm. and we need to share that information across the team. So that way the treatment plan can really be intended to optimize how that child's doing in all of those, in all those settings. So, um, you know, I think part of it is educating families about the importance of, well, is it as easy as, you know, saying, can you talk to the teacher? Well, no, I mean, we need some consents and we need it on the the doctor side and the school side, and those have to be signed, both of them, before, you know, a contact can be made. And then, you know, um, some providers like to be available at school meetings. And I think that is helpful, too. I mean, that just is a a way to prevent telephone tag, right? And, (laughs) And, you know, everybody's at the table hearing it the way, you know, firsthand. And, just learning to collaborate together. Um, And I can't tell you how often I love, I mean, I love reaching out to schools because, you know, I get a lot of firsthand um, observations from teachers and educators about what they're seeing, what they've tried. Um, And I think it's just so important to do that. Um, It's so important. I have to stop you for a second. Okay. (laughs) Because it is. So first of all, the fact that uh, you are reaching out to the schools, I suppose the classroom teacher, yep. if they're, uh, if the student is getting um, counseling within schools, I suppose you're, you're speaking with them. Uh, do you speak with the related service providers, like a physical therapist, occupational therapist? Yes. Okay. I do. So here's the key is that Very, very seldom, if at all, have I heard of a doctor reaching out to the schools and calling. Now, suddenly as an educator, now, although I'm very comfortable because I have, you know, expanded my knowledge base as well in my comfort level, it does put an air of, oh, okay, I need to pay attention to detail here. I need to know more of what's going on outside of the class here um, and school. So that way I can help to really support the family structure. And so I'm curious, what kind of um, dynamics has that been? Has it been ongoing communication? Have you been able to share certain resources that you've had follow up where the educators have been able to have maybe a deeper understanding Mm -hmm. and been able to implement certain strategies within the classroom setting? How, like basically how are the benefits of that communication shown itself? Yeah, I mean, in many, many ways. So the first call in contact is just to introduce myself. And, you know, because oftentimes, not only are families, by the time they get come to see me, not only are families feeling kind of overwhelmed, and, you know, usually there's a a real need to kind of figure out the treatment plan, but to get everybody coordinated. So um, teachers are also feeling this way, too, because oftentimes kids are having behaviors, they're not learning, they're not keeping up, whatever. And so really, the idea for me when I reach out to schools is to introduce myself on behalf of the family, but then also to inquire, like, what are you seeing? What are you observing? And just how important that information is for me 
because if I suggest or we plan out a treatment plan with the family and we're not seeing the results that we need, uh, why are we doing it, right? So I need to know and invite the, you know, the school, whoever is, you know, in that arena to feel like they can share that information. Cause it's, it, that it's so important because you spend, you know, half of the time with the kids, right. And you're seeing them firsthand. So just getting what I call a baseline, like what, what's been tried up until this point, what are the, what are their concerns? And then just to the, that they know that I'm a resource and then ongoing, I sort of leave it up to the teachers to reach out to me as long as the parents are fine with that because again I, I respect the fact that they are busy and doing a lot with not just the child at question but all the kids in the classroom right so um, I leave that as an open uh, uh, invitation however if a parent says um you know, gosh, you know, it's been a several months, we've, we're doing these things, we're not seeing traction, or we're seeing a change in the child's behavior or learning, um, then that's a cue to me that I need to reach out again, you know, just to kind of retool, repivot, kind of see if there's anything else different or changed. Um, and so um, that's helpful. And then also to just help um, make sure that everybody's doing things consistently. And I never want to be the one coming in and saying, well, you need to do it this way because no, I don't know that setting. I don't know what the dynamics are in that classroom. So I'm more like information gathering. So that way, usually what happens is I'll learn what's what's working and what's not working in the classroom. And then I can serve to repeat and help the family understand that so that they can implement it at home. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. And just, or reinforce that message. Yes. Right. And do, do the families see you on somewhat of a regular basis? How does this work with communication, such a foundation of the services that you provide? Yes. Well, so it's my, um, my, my wish, um, because if kids are on medication, let's just say that subset of kids who are on medication, I really do need to be seeing them every three months, just mm -hmm. because I need to monitor height, weight, and blood pressure, as well as, you know, checking in with them and making sure that we're moving in the right direction. And so um, typically, I'll see them every three months. And then, you know, uh, depending on what has happened in the interim, um, then that may jog me to then reach out to the school again, or so the family will reach out to me and say, hey, Dr. Bauer, um, it's March in the school, we're getting ready to do another IEP meeting. So can you provide any updates from the past year? So right. I'm happy to do that too. Right. Yes. And, and it is so important. And uh, it's, it's such a a great way to work on a multidisciplinary level where we even as educators say, wow, there's so much more information out there because sometimes we feel like we're just stuck with the symptoms and the demands of the curriculum trying to catch up. Now we've got so many emotions from COVID coming through Yes, that sometimes I would believe that, you know, having someone such as yourself come in and say, hey, I'm here as a support too, uh, is, is just a great way, not only to help with that child, but you're learning along the way. And the more that educators are open to having a dialogue with you, then it really allows for that spark of saying, wow, you know what? There's more I could be doing here. I could tweak it or this, you know what? What I'm doing is right. And it feels mm -hmm. good yeah. and it is working and I'm going to keep running with it. Um, but now I know why. Because now there's a deeper understanding of that why. And, and I believe that you can really, you know, provide that type of information through that communication. So I think one of the takeaways from this conversation right now is that if you're an educator and you know that one or more of your students is seeing um, and getting service outside, whatever those services are, really talk with your parents and say, you know, I would really like to open up that communication to be able to help the students with my, my student even more. And I think it just lends itself to better learning, more time on task, and even behavior management too. Mm -hmm, for sure. I mean, and again, I can't stress this enough. I mean, communication is so key and we're learning. I mean, not, not every child with ADHD acts or thinks the same. And so the treatment plan is not always right. going to be the same, right? right? And in fact, we we need to know that it's probably not going to be. And so I would say, you know, there doesn't necessarily have to, we don't have to wait till like the, there's a fire, 
you know, to, yeah. to have those discussions, just say, hey, like, I'm here for you. And I just want to meet you just so that way, in case anything happens, you know, things are going well right now. But, you know, in the event that something changes, how can I reach out? So I want to switch gears for a second, because a lot of doctors will send in to teachers a Connors report. Yes. And right. And they, and they for a, and maybe you can explain what a Connors report is to our listeners. Yeah. So um, so there's so a Connors or a Vanderbilt scale. These typically are what we call screening tools, which are validated um sets of questions that are used by the pediatrician to identify and monitor ADHD. And to make the diagnosis of ADHD, we need to make sure that the child is having certain symptoms or behaviors across multiple settings. And that's why it's important to get both parent and teacher input. But then also it has to be present for a specific period of time and severity has to be there. And not only does the symptoms have to be there, but it also has to be impairing that child. So meaning that it's um, affecting how they are doing at home and school. So um, those tools are our standard tools, paper forms typically, but now, you know, there, there's a lot of them are electronic too, to help, you know, just get it back to each other. But um, it's really important to use these in the initial stages of identifying ADHD, but then also ongoing. So every three months, I'll typically have my families uh, fill these out and get that from the teacher. Because like I said, if we're doing anything in treatment and anything can include medicine, but it can also include school accommodations, parenting support, behavioral therapy, any of those things, all of those things should be working together to move and decrease symptoms and make sure that the child is, is doing well. And so that's how I, kind of collect that objective data from parents and teachers over time to document that. And that is so important because as an educator, I will get um, one of those reports or those scales really to, to indicate the child's performance, but I'll get one and that's it for the school year. And it's very difficult to um, really complete at the beginning of the school year. So for instance, I recently had a student and I filled one out and I had known that the father didn't get to the doctor yet. And it had been a couple of months and I had seen a change in some of those behaviors. So I asked to, to complete a whole new one and sent that one home. But first I really did compare what, what the first one was compared to the second. So educators and parents, you really want to think about and remember, okay, what, what point in within the school year? Because if you're in the spring and it's only been six weeks, it may not be too much of a change within the classroom. Mm -hmm. But if it's longer, or educators, if you see a change, reach out to the parents and say, I would like to, to complete another scale. So that way you can update your child's doctor. Mm -hmm. And same thing with the parents. This is such great information. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Because really, we want to be able to say, hey, you know what, it's been a little while now. And I want to be able to uh, update the doctor, because you need to keep it active. Our children are active, they're actively learning, they're using strategies, or maybe they're falling off a little bit and need to be brought back in. And so this is such a great structure and communication tool. Um, so, so thank you for really highlighting that what, what great practice that you have. It's really very sound and, and, and really proactive. But now what about for the doctor who says, well, I don't have time. I don't have time. And, you know, what is it that you can share that, yes, given one of these scales can provide you with information, but what are you getting that's deeper and more by communicating to the to the educators themselves. Yeah, uh, so so yes, these forms have a place and they should be used, again, to capture data, uh, not just once, because it, it is a snapshot in time and that's why we need to do it uh, with a, a regular frequency. But I also think that educators get so many of these too. I mean, it's, you know, so I think it's not a substitute for at least once a year, uh, or, or whenever to, to, to at least invite conversation because those questions are so, you know, standard 
you know, you sort of get used to seeing the same ones over and over again and circling, you know, two, three, two, three, you know, whatever you want to circle. But there's so much more richer information you can get in a five minute phone call. Right. Yes. About about what yes. you're seeing, what you've tried. I mean, it, it, the, those questioners don't go into that. Right. And and the Vanderbilt and the Connor form, they tend to typically focus on what we call the core symptoms of ADHD, which is super important to focus on. But we also know that um, ADHD is not just a behavioral diagnosis, it's an executive functioning issue. Yeah. And that's why there's other measures that I also incorporate, like the Brown Executive Functioning Scale, or others use the brief which look at those other skill sets. And if you don't do those in practice, you know, my general pediatricians probably don't do those. You can also just, you know, pick up the phone um, and ask those questions. Like how, what are, how are some of the, how is, um, you know, Timmy doing in terms of like turning in assignments and organizing his desk? Is the desk always messy? Is, you know, all these different things that reflect a little bit more like task initiation, organization, prioritization, all these other executive functioning skills. Now, for the busy doctor who's like, I do not have time to pick up the phone and talk to, you know, all the teachers of my patient panel. um, I get that. So two questions um, your office can ask and and add to the Vanderbilt or Connors. You know, please, just re- in your own words, tell me how you think the student is learning uh, compared to other peers. And are there any other areas of concern? I mean, those two questions at least, you know, kind of help the, the educator sort of go a little bit deeper and then they could just fax it back to you, you know, so you don't necessarily have to, to pick up the phone, but then you can also put like, if you want to connect about a specific concern, please call my office, right? Right. And I think it's really important for people to realize that when we have this type of communication, it's not based on judgment. It's not Mm -hmm. based on, oh, he's in your class and he has a messy desk. Listen, I have kids who no matter what I do, no matter how I try, their desk is messy. You know, but now you just said some, but they're improving in different ways. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. So, but you said something really important as a follow-up. You said, well, it's the executive functioning skills. It could be the task initiation. You see, there's this whole clinical psychological world that we, you and I right now, are trying to pull in to the educational world as you pulled out the educational world into yours. And it's not, it's not it's not functional yet. And so we need to understand as educators, there's a lot that we have not been educated on. And when we open up to having communication with even a behavior specialist such as myself, when I'm talking with even other educators, some are like, all right, this is what I see. This is what we've got. Uh, And others are like, well, I've been teaching for 14 years and I've been doing blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, but I'm here for you, with you. I want to help you. You can help me. We can work together. And so I think it's really important to remember that we all have our knowledge base and it's just shared information. So we can take what you're saying. And now Dr. Bauer can do what she does with information, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. if you get information from a teacher about like, let's talk about that messy desk for a second, you know, can you, right? So, Mm -hmm. and and the jacket's on the floor and they're losing their pencils and it goes in that black abyss like Henry did, (laughs) you know, because it's true, they're gone, they never come back. Um, So what is that an indicator for you on your end that educators might not realize? Um, well, so again, I think, you know, as we're talking through this, I mean, ADHD, like I said, is an executive functioning issue. Yes. Um, it, it's a brain-based condition. And really, in childhood, we have the ability as that child's team to be a safe space for this child to be able to learn and practice these essential life skills. Because even if medicine is used, medicine by itself, pills do not teach skills. And we all have our zones of genius and how we can interact with that family to help support them. And, you know, the d- discussion of a messy desk is really helpful because in the end, that is what affects that child's self-esteem, their quality of life, and helps them, you know, get some wins. So if they can start, like, 
doing those simple tasks, well, not simple to them, but you know, like right, right. You know, start learning those skills. So that way their day just starts off easier. Uh, you know, that the child then feels a sense of, you know, self-esteem that they're like, oh, I can do this rather than always hearing like, why are you always losing these pencils? Why can't you bring this home? Why can't, you know, you turn in your homework, all these negatives. And we really want to help build them up. Right. Because just as you mentioned, it may not be simple to them, but the act for us might seem so simple. So when you have a child, there's everything stuffed. It's amazing. It's really, it's crazy. I don't know how they function, but everything stuffed in the back of their desk and they use like the inch, the first inch, yeah, yes. everything. And they gently get it out. And I don't know how they do it, but then they're like, I don't have it, but then it's really stuffed in the back of their desk. You know, so you're talking about task initiation. That is like, okay, you have a pencil case. Take a deep breath, reach inside the desk for specifically that pencil case to put the pencil in that uh-huh. task initiation, something that it's like, oh, I'll just put it right here. It'd be so much easier. Yeah. You know, it's hard to get over that. Well, and thank you for saying that because it points out the fact, and this is something that, you know, I have to talk with families when they're first learning about what ADHD is, is, you know, um, the, the frontal lobe the, the, of the brain is still developing until the child is there in their mid-20s. It doesn't matter if they have ADHD or not, but if you layer ADHD on top of that, then it means that those executive functioning skills that are uh, you know, kind of coming from that frontal lobe, it's actually lagging three to five years behind yes. normal age peers. Yeah. And when I tell parents this, they're like, oh, really? (laughs) And then all of a sudden, all the feelings of, oh my gosh, like I've been getting mad at them because I assume that they should be able to do this. And it's, and I think that's where that education, that knowledge is power, that collaboration, connection and working, like how do we support this child where they are? And even though to us, it may be like, well, they should know that. No. And so if you can learn how to break it down, make things visual, make things in chunks so it's not overwhelming and really learn how the ADHD brain works and and own it. Right. Um, But and work with it like everybody will, will be in such a better place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where it is. It's really in the education for understanding because with this invisible disability, they look like their age, but they're not Mm -hmm. functioning their age. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Bauer, how can our listeners today get in touch with you? Yes. So my uh, website is called letstalkkidshealth.org. And on that website, you'll get to see everything that I do, including my very, very small private practice uh, for those local in Indiana. But I also have a parenting book club that I do. I have a Let's Talk Kids Health live show where I bring experts and guests to talk about behavioral health and parenting issues. That's why it's called Let's Talk Kids Health, because we want to talk together about these things, and then also about my course and my membership site. So um, I welcome anybody um, to reach out to me, connect with me. Uh, If you like what you heard and want more, please just reach out and, um, you know, let's learn together. Let's keep talking. Dr. Bauer, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and your passion in really teaching our listeners that there is ways that we can help these children and families and educators and even the doctors that they attend. So we really value your time and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Make it a great day. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.